Hi, I'm Edwin Rutsch, Director of the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, and this is a dialogue on how do we build a more empathic uh, society. And I'm here with Elif. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself? Your last name is a little hard to pronounce. So. Sure, uh, Elif Gökçidan. I'm the founder of Empathy Building Through Museums Initiative. And you're also, I see, a, a historian of Islamic art. Correct. And a, and a museum scholar, is that? Yes, I studied, my background is history of Islamic arts and museum studies. Okay. Is there more you'd like to say about your background before we move um, on? I think, and, and I'm the old editor of two books now. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, Fostering Empathy Through Museums. Uh, and this one? one? I got that yes. whole one. Can we hear and see the other one? We can, this would be a good shot for the yes. okay. shot. Oh, shall I do it again? Yeah, we'll put, hold on. The other one. The other one. I'll hold this oh, one. Oh, and then the other one. Yeah. Okay, so this is the new one. Great. And they're both on I empathy. Uh, fostering yes. empathy through museums and then designing for empathy perspectives. Yeah. On the that. museum experience. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Great. <laughs> well, good. Yeah, I'm really pleased to, uh, you know, to chat with you. You've been doing a lot of work on empathy and um, I want to talk about your books and, uh, you know, you're, you say, it says here you're, you're committed to creating fertile grounds of empathy through informal learning platforms to inspire positive behavior, behavior change, caring mindset, and compassionate worldviews. So you've really been work, wanting to, in the same like myself, create a more empathic society and culture. Exactly, exactly. And, I, and when I uh, first had the idea of uh, uh, utilizing museums as you know, readily available platforms for this purpose, I, I use your, the resources that you made available online a great deal. So thank you so much for your work. Oh, great. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm very impressed like with all the authors. The, like this first book, maybe we can just review this a little bit, is um, there's like 15 case studies. Uh, that's right. This, uh -huh. this uh, fostering empathy through museums was the was the first compilation, uh, with the idea of looking into uh, the greater field of museums in general, uh, to see whether empathy was something that they were thinking, that they were it was on their radar or not, and and if they were thinking, what were they doing with it, and how they well, how they were implementing it, uh, was it intentional or as a uh, or was it a byproduct of an experience? Uh, and and uh, so the, the outcome of that book, basically, I invited uh, 15 uh, contributors from different types of museums, from arts museums to children's to civil rights to uh, an animal sanctuary, uh, and of course, science museums as well, to, to, to see, uh, again, you know, how they were uh, employing empathy. Uh, that was the main question I posed to them, uh, just and just left it open, mm. and just to get a feel of like what the field is thinking about this. And interestingly, when I approached some of them, um, uh, I so this was invited. Uh, these chapters were invited. I, I had sort of researched beforehand to and identified several examples that I thought in my mind would fit under this category of, you know, museums fostering empathy intentionally. Uh, but when I approached to them, um, it took some thinking on their part, some mm. of the institutions. And yes, I mean, naturally, their first reaction was, yeah, of course, you know, like this is what we do every day. But then nobody was really talking about it intentionally. And, and I believe the, the power of intentions and when we name something, when we identify something, um, it becomes more of a concrete thing that we can then um, uh, look, you know, 360 degrees around it and see you know what works what doesn't work um how does it look in other platforms what can we learn from other industries other um you know educational institutions and and from all walks of life hmm. so um, you really got them starting to think about it and you're sort of like saying hey would you think about this and you, you're kind of bringing up this topic and they're all starting to set the intention yeah what is this all about yeah exactly exactly i think i think that's exactly what happened so that i think that question just posing the question and inviting them to contribute a chapter i think allowed these you know very busy professionals to just spend the time take the time to think about uh, and articulate you know their day-to-day -to -day operations and look at it in a under this you know through this filter 
Um, and, what is and, the, oh, sorry. What is the new uh, book about? That or is it? Yeah. So actually, maybe uh, allow me. To, you know, so okay, that yeah, the, sorry, the go ahead. Go the first ahead. book because it okay. ties directly into okay, the second cool. book uh -huh. and why the second book. Uh, so the first book, the outcomes of the first book was uh, basically I found out that museums were thinking about empathy in um, through uh, three main avenues. Uh, one, uh, empathy as an institutional value, uh, from their hiring practices to you know, uh, their, their accessibility and inclusiveness, you know, including other voices, community voices, or voices of other departments within the museum. Uh, and, and, and the second one was uh, using empathy as an educational tool. Uh, uh, but um, what I found out was mostly, it was with the intention that, oh, you know, how can we empathize with our community, oh, you know, get, uh -huh. get in you know, uh, their mind, so we can serve them better by bringing them through our doors and, and educating them. So it wasn't exactly a two-way empathy. It was more like, you know, with the best intentions, but it was like uh, truly um, uh, from a, like educational perspective. How can mm -hmm. we educate them? Yes, they're, it's like they're, they're empathizing with their people coming to the museums. They're there to listen and how can they educate? Exactly, uh, about the museum specific content. Mm -hmm. So this is not about an education on empathy though. It oh, is about, right. for example, if it's an art museum, how can we empathize with our audience? You know, what, for example, what would, uh, what, uh, would bring teenagers through our doors? Let's, you know, like maybe invite them and then talk to them and understand their uh, uh, wishes so that we can better design programs, so that we can educate them on, let's say, you know, 20th century Western art. Uh, and, and then uh, the, the third avenue was, uh, which is you know, really where my heart is, is uh, examining empathy as a human phenomenon. And just like any other scientific phenomenon, which uh, not many institutions do, and also, uh, exploring whether uh, empathy can be learned or experienced or fostered uh, through a museum experience. So here the outcome is not exactly about you know, educating an audience about a certain topic. It is more about um, creating a self-awareness uh, through self-knowledge, uh, getting to know our own emotions and our reactions, you know, biases with all good and bad, uh, parts of, of being a human, uh, then uh, in, in a safe space, uh, mm -hmm. not in a, in a traumatic, you know, like a, like a clashing way, but in a safe space through interactive games and experiential learning, storytelling, dialogue, or creating truly immersive experiences uh, to allow individuals to learn about themselves first. Mm -hmm. And okay, then, so let me just see. So the, the third way is like how to how to learn about yourself, a way of sort of personal growth and learning uh, about yourself. How do you create a space for that personal growth and learning? Exactly, uh -huh. and, and emotional literacy. Mm -hmm. So and, for, and, like your emotions, understanding yourself, and yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, and because I think like, yeah, games and you know play and the immersive experiences they just put us on the spot. You know they don't tell us what to do. Uh, so quickly uh -huh. we have to figure a way out, and this creates a, a quick pragmatic perspective shift, whether we want it or not, whether whether we are ready or not. But once we go through that uh, experience in a safe environment, we learn because we have experienced that whatever that took place. And now we know that we can actually do this in other settings mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. So you're creating, a, creating an experiential space where you experience something and you grow through that experience. Exactly, uh -huh. exactly. so experience is at the heart of uh, this, this approach. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and then uh, through uh, a book review project with uh, uh, University of California, Berkeley's Greater Good Science Center, uh, they have this, you know, magazine, uh, and uh, I work with their editor, and she helped me think through the entire content of this first book in an entirely new way, because uh -huh. she said, well, you know, we have blogs, and, you know, uh, people like to know, you know, five things about this, or, you know, how to do this in 10 steps, and that sort of thing, and I said, well, this is an excellent opportunity, so I, I'll basically create an executive summary of the book. So by working with her and, and uh, through her guidance, 
she was able to uh, incorporate some of the scientific uh, documents, you know, scientific background into uh, what makes empathy such a transformational experience and why museums are suitable. So, so I wrote this um, uh, article for them. It's called Five Ways Museums Can Increase Empathy in the World. Uh, and that's basically the executive summary of the first book, Fostering Empathy Through mm -hmm. Museums, mm -hmm. which are uh, creating the safe space to encounter ourselves, our own emotions, and also the other, uh, okay. whoever, or uh -huh. whatever that might be. Uh, storytelling, dialogue, experiential learning, uh, experiences of awe and wonder, and contemplation. Mm, okay, so let's easy. review those again. So the first one was creating a safe space. So you're creating a, a safe space. Yeah. The second one was storytelling. Storytelling. Mm -hmm. Well, storytelling is how uh, we are wired. That's how we learn. Mm -hmm. uh, long before writing was invented, we transferred our knowledge and wisdom and all of our survival techniques through stories. So they are uh, an extremely powerful tool. Uh, and, and museums are natural storytellers. Mm -hmm. That's what they do. Uh, but then, now that we have named it and we have identified that this is a very important critical ingredient, I think there's more room to improve also. Whose stories we are telling? Whose stories we are not telling? Why? Yeah. So, that, so that, that's the whole idea. By okay. articulating and focusing on certain elements, let's see what we unpack these and what, what we can do with these. Uh, and this, the third one topic was uh, dialogue, creating... Uh, Exactly, uh -huh. dialogue. So there again, you know, they can be safe spaces, ideally, uh, for everyone, not just one, you know, a part of the community. Uh, uh, but uh, at least they are not usually, you know, traumatic spaces where, you know, you can just you know, voice your opinion. And you are usually on your own terms when you are visiting a museum. Mm -hmm. if, you know, if somebody doesn't bother you, you can just choose to look at something more deeply or just move away. So there's no grading, there's no uh, uh, like a final exam. You, you learn at your own pace, mm -hmm. so this okay. is for informal learning. And, 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 and dialogue happens within this. You know, if you are in a, a group, in a community, oh, or okay. even dialogue with yourself or with the artwork, it's, it's just the, it's creating the space and the time that takes to immerse ourselves in a, into an experience. Uh, so what was the fourth one? We had uh, safety, storytelling, dialogue. dialogue and, and, and a sense of uh, awe and wonder. Oh, awe and wonder. So this is uh, a critical um, element of, um, I think, finding our place in the universe because it just basically messes up all our, what we know about the scale of our existence. It pulls the rug out of, you know, under our feet and just, I mean, imagine like seeing our galaxy within the uh, mm -hmm. uh, spectrum of, you know, the, the, the vastness of the entire universe, which we don't even know how big it is. It just creates, you know, uh, hopefully some humbleness, humility, mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and realizing that, you know, there's so much we don't know, and, and, and it seems like everything is connected. Uh, uh -huh. like, creates sort uh, of a sense of openness, maybe. Okay. To... Exactly, uh -huh. exactly. And what and, was the last one? The... And then the last one is contemplation. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, reflection. Uh, again, you know, we are always so busy. Uh, everyone is so busy and uh, busy, you know, either if you're students, you know, getting good grades and if you're, uh, you know, we all have our own, you know, day-to-day -day worries, but we rarely s um, take the time to uh, just step back and just take a brief, basically, breath and, and see what is going on. And, and what can I do? That's the, the ultimate step that we would like to get to, but at least um, giving people some, uh, a chance to just slow down mm -hmm. and, uh, and contemplate and reflect uh, about anything. Uh, I think that's essential. And, uh, and I would like to actually tell a story if, if we have yeah, the time. Great. Sure, as much time as you want. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, you know, this um, uh, a very, very ancient, you know, uh, Sufi story, you know, that, and, but I mean, it was, I think, put in the writing in the 12th century, but I think it goes back to India, these, you know, animal fables uh, from India. Uh, but uh, the story of the lion and the bunny. So there's this, you know, this, 
they live in this jungle and all the animals are always fearful of their lives because there's this, you know, really crazy uh, lion. He's uh, terrorizing everybody, you know, just randomly capturing one and eating for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So the folks in the forest, they get together and they say, well, you know, we cannot go on like this. So let's do this. Let's make a pact. So we will basically, just one of us will have to sacrifice himself or herself uh, three times a day, you know, like depending on who, who goes which time. So at least the rest of us can go through our lives, you know, uh, peacefully. So this happens and Lion is happy, the, you know, forest folks, jungle folks living their lives. And then when it's time for the bunny's turn, uh, he comes up with this idea. So he comes sort of like, sort of like dazzled, you know, to the uh, court of the lion when it's time for, uh, for him to be his lunch. And the lion's like, where were you? Like, why are you late? He's like, oh, I'm so sorry, you know, your highness. I was running to serve, you know, myself uh, to you as lunch, but there was this other king on the, on the southern side of this jungle, and, and he's even just so powerful and so scary, and uh, he wanted me to be his lunch. So I was, you know, basically uh, getting away from him to come to you. And the lion, of course, just touches his ego and is like, what do you mean another king? Like, I'm the only king. So take me to that you know, other lion. So they, you know, they slowly walk all the way to somewhere else. And, and uh, at the, the opening mouth of this, you know, like this uh, deep well. And the bunny says, well, I have to warn you. He's very loud and he gets louder and more uh, ferocious you know, each time you talk to him. So uh, I'm just, I'm just going to let you know. So the lion, of course, looks down in the well and he sees the, his reflection but thinking that it was the other king. So he just, you know, belts out this huge roar. And of course, with the echo, his roar comes back to him like twice the, twice the power. And this goes like back and forth a couple of times. Finally, he cannot just hold himself his anger and just jumps into the well and dies. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, we are in that uh, very moment where we are seeing our reflection uh, in the form of, you know, global climate change, you know, inequality uh, and injustice all around the world. And, and, and we kind of, I think, intuitively know that our behavior is a big part of it, if not all of it. But it is such a huge uh, burden. How do we change our behavior? How do we take the time? I mean, is there even time to do that? Is it a realistic thing to even imagine that we could change and we can create a better world? And, and uh, so that's where I think the museums come, come mm-hmm. in. Mm-hmm. So they could be the, the, the reflection, safe reflection platform oh. instead of, you know, lion trying to like increasingly uh, trying to overpower something that he has no control of. Actually, he's just hearing back, getting what goes around, comes around basically. And, and uh, uh, but what if he had the time and the mindset to just step back, wait a minute, you know, what's happening here? Let me rethink this whole thing, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think, I think that's a little bit where this, you know, contemplation fits. Uh, oh, okay. Fits uh-huh. So to start thinking about what you're doing, having some time and space to really think about what, yes. where we yes. are, what are we doing, where are we going? And, exactly. And facing uh-huh. our own behavior and our own choices, day-to-day choices. That's why I believe empathy is critical because it is the foundational element of behavior change. Well, how did you come across that? Like, how did you get started with uh, even the notion of empathy? And because you're very excited and very passionate about this topic, it seems to me. Um, and how did you get started with, with, with this? I think, you know, I mean, a couple of things, but I think it's mostly life experience. And, and um, uh, I actually thought about this and, and, and I came to the conclusion that this was how I was brought up mm-hmm. and, and the way I see the world, my worldview shapes what I do, what I put out, you know, put forward. And, and, um, and my father, um, uh, you know, had to work all his life, you know, and, and he didn't go to school, but he was a great storyteller mm. and, and he could, you know, and he would just have, you know, like maybe three random things on the table like a, a, a glass half full, for example, a coffee cup and 
and, and he used to smoke, you know, maybe his cigarette. And he, he, he could tell a story about those three things. But the moral of the story would always uh, come to what does it mean to be a human being? What makes us human? What is our responsibility? What is our role? And what is this, to what end we are human beings? So, um, and then, you know, through life experience, now that I have my own family and I moved from, I'm originally from Turkey, uh, I moved here and I have my, you know, uh, kids. And I was thinking, you know, I'm, I'm not a good storyteller, you know, like not as uh, close to my father. And, and what am I going to do? How am I going to teach my own children some of these concepts? So I thought, well, you know, as an individual, what do I know? What can I do with what I know? Mm -hmm. I cannot solve the, the, all the world's problems. I cannot be everything. But, okay, I'm an art historian. I love Islamic arts. I love history. I love archaeology. I love museums. I've, I've studied all, this, all these things. Uh, but, you know, uh, so what can I do you know, practically, in terms of practicality, with what I know? And I said, well, you know, maybe I should just write this down. And so that's how it all began. I wrote this. I was actually talking to a friend who recommended uh, after all this, you know, talk. Uh, she said, Elif, you know, uh, I can understand that you're clearly very passionate. But whatever the, the most important thing that stuck to my mind uh, after our three hour conversation <laughs> is that the story that your father used to tell you. And so this is very deep, you know, you should just think about it and write something, but in a story format and see what happens. And, and, uh, and, and, and the story is actually, again, you know, um, in um, my parents had a, like a small uh, house on an island in Turkey and we had a small garden. My father used to plant all kinds of, you know, vegetables, you know, fruit trees and everything. And again, you know, he could tell stories about these plants in the garden. And sometimes as we were just you know, picking them up and you know, preparing you know, a salad for lunch. But the, the, again, the, the moral of the story would be like, you know, look at this red tomato and look at this really hot you know, green pepper right next to it. Uh, there's a cucumber right next to it on the ground, which is practically flavorless, but it has its own qualities, you know. So uh, he would tell me that like, all of this is what makes it beautiful, what makes life beautiful. Our, our diversity, uh, but, but the unity. You know, if, if we didn't have the sweet pepper, we wouldn't know the, the qualities of the hot pepper. Mm -hmm. you know, so everything is in balance and there's a reason. So it, as a human being, I think we need to teach ourselves how to uh, see our interconnectedness and, and contemplate about our role and what we can be within this big, big uh, oneness. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you grew up in a family where storytelling was important as well as sort of deeper empathy that sort of an empathic exactly. sort of a way of being, of, of exactly. uh, feeling into life and exploring life and, and growth. Exactly. And, and I'm also hearing maybe that there's this sense of wanting to contribute. How can you contribute to the, to the world and to well-being? And you're just using the resources that you have, your your academic skills and and the community that you're in so you're trying to work within that uh, context exactly exactly uh -huh. and uh -huh. and you know and the thing is that you know this uh, empathy uh, as i assume that what this is what you are trying to do also like creating these dialogues and circles this isn't this isn't there's no instructions manual for this you can only live it live and learn from authentic experiences and and authentic role models who are sincerely believing in what they do and they don't, they don't waver. They, they're not like this way one day and then that way the, the next day. You know, it is, it's about also values and ethics and uh, everything is connected. So it is just one of the tools, but empathy is one of the tools, but a very important one, I think. Hmm. Well, how did you get the word even empathy and the concept of empathy? I mean, you, I didn't hear that your father talked about empathy. He might've had the essence you know, the, the mindset of an empathic, open way of being. Where did you kind of learn about the word and, you know, kind of delve yeah. into it more? Yeah, actually, the, the, the word, I mean, when I uh, uh, sort of examined and sort of went sort of inwards and trying to figure out, like, what that was that made me, like, think that way or see the world this way, 
is uh, uh, is basically as close as it gets is is, is empathy. You know, feeling mm -hmm. okay. like another uh -huh. or having the ability or the, be, the the willingness to just you know take the time. But it is not just one thing. It is not a transactional thing. It has it is multifaceted, multi layered. Uh, so it is not just uh, it doesn't have one single description, and also uh, empathy is used uh, in in literature. Uh, the first appeared in the art 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 setting. Right. So feeling into you know the German origin of the of the word empathy Einfühlung is feeling into something, and um, and interestingly, my professor uh, at Istanbul Technical University uh, when I was doing my uh, graduate studies there in art history. Uh, she comes from this uh, German school of uh, art history, oh. uh, from Panofsky and, you know, from the Warburg school. And uh, they all talk about, you know, the meaning of, you know, symbols. And, you know, so it just fits right into like how I was brought up. And, and uh, that also helped me, I think, make the connection that how this word could be uh, a really important tool in an in a arts and in any, any engagement with objects that we can, you know, uh, learn how to make meaning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it sounds like it was, you have sort of the mindsets, this empathic interest, and that was like the word that most resonated, that most accurately fit the sort of the qualities that you wanted to, uh, to work on. Exactly. And, okay. And how did that kind of get started? You just, you were saying that, I'm just curious, like you, you just found the, the words like, oh, this is really, this is the word that sort of resonates with me and yeah. I'm gonna work on this. How did that okay. kind of come about? You know, how that's did- really, That's really interesting actually. So, um, so I had this, you know, seed in my mind planted and, and I was basically looking at everything in life about like, what can I do with what I know? Uh, but mostly looking at museums and like really hoping and dying to find a really excellent example that somebody was already doing this. Like I could not be the first one and I'm not the first one, but you know, uh, intentionally like bringing to on the, on the, um, in the portfolio, uh, maybe that's new, but of course museums and, you know, storytellers, artists have been doing this. Musicians have been doing this forever. And, um, so, uh, in one of my trips, I ended up in San Francisco, and uh, I Exploratorium is one of my favorite oh, yeah. institutions. Mm -hmm. So, and I knew that they had this exhibition uh, that opened a few years ago. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's still there. It's called the Science of Sharing, and and when I read about it in New York Times, I think um, in 2012 or 13, uh, I was quite surprised. I was so excited to see that an institution was looking at human behavior as a topic of an exhibition and an experiential learning opportunity. And so this is not about an exhibition, this is not an exhibition about psychology, you know, these are the famous psychologists and like this is what happened, you know, he invented this, she invented that. It's not like that. It is basically they have, you know, social psychologists and, and, and a diverse, you know, uh, rep representatives from diverse disciplines come together and, and, and figure out how they can uh, interpret uh, what we know about you know, uh, behavioral economics, social psychology, uh, concepts like you know, the, the prisoner's dilemma or tragedy of the commons and things like that and turn them into games that everyone can enjoy without even knowing like how many you know, volumes went into just creating that, you know, identifying that concept, you know, this experience. So uh, uh, at the time, the curator of that exhibition, uh, uh, Hugh McDonald kindly uh, uh, gave me a tour of the exhibit. Uh, some of them were prototypes. And there was this particular uh, exhibit uh, so you would sit at a, like a, a, a cafe table and you would have a, um, like a, what do you call it, placemats, each person, but you can play it on your own, but we happen to be two people. Mm -hmm. And it is actually to create social uh, dialogue, you know, uh, and interaction. Um, and uh, there, are, there was um, uh, two squares drawn on the placemat and on one square, it said public, the other said uh, private. And then there was a deck of cards for each player uh, with uh, random pictures of uh, things uh, that we 
use every day uh, from a car, a telephone, a cell phone, uh, and you know, uh, water, oil, information, laptop, you know, things like that. And so I asked him, um, what am I supposed to do? I, I, I expected some guidance from him. Uh, am I supposed to divide these images according to how I perceive them as public or private? And he said, well, this is non-facilitated experience. Oh. <laughs> so you have to uh -huh. figure it out. So that was step one in me, like being put on the spot in a safe space. And, and I said, oh, okay then. And then I started sort of dividing them. And he did, he did the same. So we spent maybe like two, three minutes just doing that. And I looked up and, you know, he was somewhat dividing them evenly. And whereas I put everything I have in public. And I was thinking, you know, water, you know, like borders don't mean anything. Like water is an essential life source. It belongs to the entire planet. You know, I, and this sincerely, this is what I was thinking. And, and, and I said, oh my gosh, I, I guess I misunderstood the game. And uh, I sort of apologized. And he said, no, no, no. We all make different choices. So that was step two and the final sort of <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, sort of hit on the you know, nail, to so to speak. And that's it, basically. We are faced with choices, many choices every day, uh, big and uh, small. And it depends on how we choose to act, mm -hmm. what makes us who we are and the world that we live in. Mm -hmm. So just an awareness that we all make choices and we all... And that's kind of who we are then? Exactly. It's those exactly. choices that we make. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, and it is very, it was very empowering. And now that I've seen myself sort of like an out of body experience, oh, like, uh -huh. oh, I've put like everything uh -huh. in here. And, and so what is my responsibility then? What am I doing with this? And on top of that, I was so happy to see that like this was happening in a museum setting, mm -hmm. the way I was kind of envisioning. Of course, exploratorium is, they're trendsetters, you know, they're ahead yeah. of, uh -huh. uh, they, they uh, paved the way for future. Very trends. experiential, totally amazing. experiential. Amazing, yeah. uh -huh. amazing place. And, and I was like, oh my gosh, like this should be everywhere. This should be in all museums, in children's museums, history museums, everything. Like we have to figure out a way uh -huh. to incorporate this type of experiential learning. So it is not about, you know, you learn about, you know, 18th century history, but you learn something about yourself and uh -huh. what you do. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, I mean, it's like it's empathy, history, content, like everything. But the thread that connects everything is uh, empathy. Mm -hmm. Well, you were kind of going back a little bit. I mean, you're, you're seeing like I, I, I feel that we need a culture of empathy that really the, the quality of empathy is if, if, you know, humanity were to really raise this value up, uh, you know, make it a primary social value that it would just really foster much better well-being you know across the planet so it seems like you have a you have sort of the similar same vision that it's really this quality of empathy that uh, we need to really foster exactly the humanity exactly. exactly so um so after this you know actually uh, going back to your earlier question you know the the, the second book uh so i decided to look into uh the elements of empathy okay uh, and I, I i believe you use it uh, as like aspects of empathy you also have a term for that uh or um yeah there's like, a lot what, of different what, i facets maybe facets yeah, facets yeah yeah aspects yeah to yes. uh, so i i called it uh the alchemy of empathy okay because i believe it is not just pure science it is not pure art it is everything uh, plus some other things that we have not even thought about yet. You know, we will just find out, I think, the more we find out about our own humanness, that those ingredients will come up. But uh, uh, so this book, Designing for Empathy, uh, talks about, uh, asks, you know, three uh, major questions uh, and how the, that's how the book is structured. The, the first part is, uh, what is the object of your empathy? So empathy, uh, by, by definition, uh, invites uh, a duality, seeing the world in a dualistic way, that there's an other to empathize with. Uh -huh. But you know, there are some traditions and many traditions and, you know, the, and our learnings, I think, of, from all of our mistakes, 
show us that we are actually one. We are interconnected, inherently interconnected, whether we realize it or not, whether we like it or not. Uh, so how do we then cope with that? You know, like what is the object of your empathy? Because if you just define empathy uh, in a very transactional way, a very clinical way, uh, then its meaning will change everywhere you go, from individual to individual, to institution to institution, to you know, country to country or community to community. Because no matter where you go around the world, there's always an other. We, we other people, right? We, we create others wherever we go. Sometimes we ourselves others to at some communities. So there's this uh, dilemma. And, and uh, that's where I think uh, museums can play a critical role. In addition to the five ingredients that we discussed earlier, they have a unique responsibility, I think, to create these new narratives that talk about our oneness and our you know, mm -hmm. inherent interconnectedness. Because ultimately, this depends, this shapes our worldview, the, 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 the glasses through which we experience the world and mm -hmm. the universe. So is it, are you saying there's a sense of, of, of disconnection and, of that, but, and connection? It would, would that be another term for it? Uh, that you know, having a sense of connection with all of life, with someone else, some others, or connection with ourselves versus a sense of disconnection and that museums could help support building connection or... Yeah, and, and also create a sort of a, you know, uh, 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 a new narrative, a, a different, a new, it's not a new worldview. I mean, it is there. Some communities practice this every day. This is how they live their lives through. It's just that I'm afraid in, you know, most Western cultures and, you know, uh, societies, uh, this was put in the back burner in a way, you know. And, and um, um, so it, it is about a museum's role can be, I think, um, uh, to give us the tools to see the world or the universe and our place within it uh, through a triple focused lens. lens. Okay. The, the first focus should be inwardly emotional literacy, uh, getting to know ourselves, good and bad parts, you know, not so good parts mm -hmm. if you're not so proud, but getting to know ourselves and recognizing our humanness. Then second uh, lens, second focus could be getting to know those same traits and, you know, qualities in others, not just people who look like us that are immediately around us, but also in all of humanity, people who don't look like us, who don't believe in what we believe, and who we may never see or encounter in our lifetimes. But knowing that we are the same, one and the same, we all have same aspirations. And then the, 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 the third you know, focus, then uh, expanding that you know, concept of empathy uh, and interconnectedness to uh, all of humanity and the environment mm -hmm. and, and the planet, including you know living and non-living uh, creatures. Well, that's that uh, it, oh, that's a bit like if we're talking about like the definition because that you, you know you write about that too. The the you know different fa different fields have different understanding of, of empathy and like when I've talked to Dan Batson, he says there's these different definitions and it's good to be really clear about what you're meaning. And then you know articulate that, and then sort of stick with it when you have your your discussion. Exactly. So, uh, in terms of that model you're putting up the self, I would see I see that as uh, sort of a self empathy, starting with feeling into the self. What is what are the sensations that I that I have now? What are the? I mean, well, I guess it, even stepping back, it seems to me that empathy is. Uh, it starts with a sort of a premise that we do feel. We, we feel, we have a sense of feeling. We feel life around us as, as beings, we feel. And so I feel, and I can attest to that from my own experience. I do have ongoing uh, feelings. 
I might not be able to articulate them well, you know, put a name on it, but I do sense, you know, I have maybe a sense of calmness or a sense of interest mm -hmm. or a sense of energy. So there, so if I feel into myself, mm -hmm. uh, it's, I call that like self-empathy. So yeah. feeling into, you know, I can feel into you. I'm, I'm seeing you kind of shake your head, mm -hmm. you know, sort of smiling. I can feel the the smile and the, you know, the energy feelings from you. And uh, then, so that's kind of like the beginning for me of so that em empathy is that sense of feeling into myself and feeling, you know, into others. And, and then you can sort of expand it in terms of perspective taking, uh, yeah. you know, feeling into life. What is all of life, you know, sort of feel like or the planet or animals or sort of an, an, an imaginative empathy that we can, take on the role like your sounds like your father was uh, you take on the role of anything these animal these these yes. fruits or vegetables you know you sort of create a narrative and an interaction a felt experience of, of, of the the qualities of, of these uh, and we can we can sort of step into the imaginative empathy of pretty much anything you know, yeah absolutely absolutely and, and again you know this is nothing new this concept or this way of looking at the world is nothing new. I'm actually looking at this uh, book right now on my bookshelf here. Uh, it is titled The Animal's Lawsuit, Lawsuit Against Humanity. This mm -hmm. is a, originally a, an Arabic manuscript from, I think, 9th century. You know, all the animals, imagine, in 9th century, people were realizing that you know, they were affecting the environment. Mm -hmm. And then they, they had the mind... The, 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 the mindset to sit down and write a book about you know what would each of these animals would say if they could bring us a you know the lawsuit mm -hmm. so already there they're imagining being the animals taking on the role of hmm, what would i be like if i was an animal what would i be saying and exactly you know, uh -huh. exactly exactly so um so this um Yes, did you have a question? Oh, just, yeah, I just, was that kind of the, I was just wanted to be sure we covered what the books had. So the oh, second book, yeah. did you feel like you sort of explained yeah. the essence of it? Yes. Or, so, uh, so, yeah, so the, the, this, you know, this, we, uh, we arrived at this you know, the conversation through the, 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 the first question of the book, what is the object of your empathy? Mm -hmm. How do we perceive an other? What, what is the other? How do we define? And, and how do we perceive? So I have uh, five chapters contributed from uh, different disciplines. So the, the difference of this book uh, from the first one is that uh, I try to expand the topic to other disciplines and other industries. Mm. To position empathy uh, with, with all its you know, practicality that how, what we can do, what should, we should be doing, you know. And uh, so the, the, the first book, uh, the first part of the book talks about seeing the world through uh, our brain. So he's a neuroscientist that contributed a chapter, uh, seeing the world through our heart. So this is some, you know, spiritual traditions talk about it. You know, of course, poets know the best, you know, uh, how to do this, but we don't really talk about it. Uh, we don't really talk about human heart as a, as a sort of like a spiritual perception organ in a way. You know, it is not just this muscle that, you know, pumps blood, but we talk about my heart aches, you know, and people die of, you know, heartache. <laughs> so we should really look into what makes us connected there. Where is it? Where is that human heart? What are we talking about? So a, a great artist contributed a book, uh, a chapter about that. And uh, the, the third one is a conscious experience. What is consciousness? What is mind? So there's so much that we do not know and we sort of operate from, uh, uh, you know, what was accepted as the norm. Uh, but uh, there's definitely new uh, theories that challenge what we think we know about our consciousness. Uh, where is it? How does it happen? Uh, that sort of thing. And then uh, the fourth one is uh, the worldview. Just we, like we discussed, I think worldview is the overarching um, uh, sort of uh, umbrella through which we see and engage with all the tools that are available to us, including empathy, compassion, love, kindness. It all depends on how we see the world mm -hmm. uh, so that whether we use it or not, or how we use it, towards whom we use it, 
to you know and uh, towards whom we keep away from right mm -hmm. and uh and then the final part uh, chapter is about augmented reality so this chapter was really i mean really blew my mind because i mean with all the technologies that are coming up now we are talking about the self you know and the other our own ego as one individual but then you know we will have avatars and you know avatars will have their own communities and you know and, and they already we already have and and uh so these creates other identities and where we are actually projecting what we know or the little we know about or him our own humanness into other levels of existence uh, which in turn will affect how we live our daily lives eventually uh, mm -hmm. as things get more automated and uh, more uh, artificial intelligence takes over. Uh, as you know, you know, one of the things that the only thing that they cannot figure out, the IT professionals, as far as I know, is how to incorporate empathy into artificial intelligence. Yeah, it's been a lot uh, of right. I've seen a lot of articles about that recently. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it is, I think, critically important to position empathy building within the context of what is going on currently so that we can simultaneously learn from each other and inform each other's work. Okay, uh, so sort of an interdisciplinary, like all, what, what are all the different and kind of bring it together? Is, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Because uh, this is like, you know, we cannot expect for the perfect uh, conditions to present themselves to us. So we start here, you know, A, B, C, it has to have, things have to happen simultaneously uh -huh. it's like the chicken and egg you know yeah they i remember uh -huh. yeah, yeah i read i heard i remember reading that just you just got to get started you can't have everything perfect we just have to start it's sort of like build the you know be driving the machine while we're building it kind of exactly yeah. exactly uh -huh. i mean i i have young kid and you know he likes uh, lego movies you know in these lego movies there are these super builders master builders they literally like know which pieces that should go onto that sort of like uh uh, airplane or space rocket ship or something and and they, they build it on the go you know this mm -hmm. is basically what what needs to uh take place yeah so we're sort of building a culture of empathy on the go, in, on the in, go. Uh, yeah, yeah we have to because it is our choice right with knowing what we know as an individual i can either choose to just complain and do nothing and get depressed or i can try doing something so that's what i'm that's my personal choice. Hmm. It, it is not perfect. It's not going to answer, you know, the, all the questions. But this is what I can do right now with what I have. And, and, um, mm -hmm. and, and then the second part of the book is called The Alchemy of Empathy. And Alchemy of Empathy is about what makes empathy such a, tr such a transformational perspective shifting experience. Uh, again, you know, I, I, I chose to use alchemy because I don't think it is just pure science or pure art, but it's a mixture of the two. Um, actually, mm, mm -hmm. we'll talk, that's like a topic of a whole you know, different yeah. discussion, whether they are different or not, which I, I don't think they are. Uh, but, uh, but also in, incorporating other worldviews, other experiences, and um, learning from all walks of life who deal with empathy. Um, so in this section, mostly, most of the experiences, most of the chapters are from museums, but it includes also non-museum contributors, such as a, a master calligrapher, uh, a master tap dance artist, uh, and, and social entrepreneurs uh, who have been doing this uh, sort of in their own ways. But again, this is a platform, I hope the book will uh, create that sort of sense of platform where um, we're actually talking all about the same thing, but from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and one of the challenges was, you know, we don't always use the same terms, to describe the same things, uh, but that's also the beauty of it. Uh, so what we can learn, how we can expand and challenge what, th what we think that we know about this. Uh, so these, you know, I came up with, you know, 13 design elements of uh, uh, alchemy of empathy. I also call them the design elements of empathy from uh, intentionality to intersectionality to um, storytelling, play, curiosity, awe and wonder, synchronicity, collective journeying, even breaking bread, uh, and, and uh, optimism and hope. And I think I missed a few, but you know, uh, uh, of course there's more, you know, but the, 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 um, 
the format of a book does not always allow uh, a live conversation as it mm -hmm. is, you know, ongoing. Uh, but uh, you have to just sort of set it, you know, freeze it uh, in time sometimes. Uh, so it sounds like you just go in every sort of direction. It's like you're just kind of trying to integrate everything, trying to, from every perspective and very open. And I wish, uh, uh -huh. I wish. I think that's what needs to take place, you know. And, uh, and then mm -hmm. the, the, the final part of the book is about... Uh, what you actually talked about in the beginning, this, uh, what I call uh, empathy as a cross-industrial shared value. And, and, and also uh, the scope and spectrum of empathy. So let's say now we agree on you know, what empathy is, what we can do with it, and these are some of the fantastic examples of what is taking place in our museums, you know, libraries, and you know, performing arts centers in different you know, formats. But then what do we do with it? How do we make use of it? Is it just enough to have these experiences happening or can we do more with it? And can we capture this? Can we identify? Can we be more intentional about this? Uh, because we often take empathy for granted. We always want empathy for ourselves and we, or for our causes, but we, um, rarely think about you know where, where it comes from mm -hmm. so where does empathy come from and the, the most sort of time of need usually you cannot find it so instead of doing you know going through the same cycle of uh, hopelessness i uh, this is a proposal that i'm proposing through the book is that why don't we try to identify those elements and ingredients of empathy and intentionally design for them mm -hmm. Uh, and this could be in any platform. Again, my background is museums and history of art, so I'm using that angle. But it doesn't have to be that way. It could be through, you know, through judiciary system, it could be through law enforcement, through health sector, through IT, education, everything. Okay, well, uh, what I was hearing, let me just reflect back what I'm hearing. So I'm hearing that sort of as individuals, we might be wanting empathy, we want to be heard, we want to be seen, we want to be acknowledged, so we, we sort of want empathy. Uh, but you're saying, like, how do we create a sort of a social system environment that sort of nurtures the, the system, the culture, uh, fosters empathy and sort of be more sort of conscious uh, about designing uh, for that? Is that kind of... Exactly, uh, exactly, exactly. I think, you know, I mean, for example, you know, as you know, uh, dialogue is a amazing amazing catalyst for empathy so what does dialogue what would dialogue look in a, a, a civil rights museum what would it look in a library what would it look like in a performing arts center or or in a school and and uh, one of the things that i've learned mm -hmm. and by putting this you know this this part of the book together is that um uh, they're actually uh, uh, they're sort of like interbeings, you know, there's not like one ingredient that answers. I think they work best in, uh, uh, in groups, uh, definitely at least three or more. And, and I like to use the metaphor of, uh, of, of water drops, uh, inspired by this uh, quote from uh, Rumi, uh, from 12th century uh, philosopher. Uh, he says, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you are not just a drop in the ocean. You are the entire ocean within a drop. So we all have all these attributes and qualities in ourselves. Uh, and, and our use of them will change depending on the context and mm -hmm. situations that we, are, we find ourselves in. Uh, but for example, if you, uh, one of the ingredients is vulnerability. Uh, if you just focus on vulnerability without perhaps play or contemplation, it could be a traumatic event and it could backfire. It could just cause us to turn all of our doors, you know, closed because it is just such an overpowering experience. So what I'm hearing there is you really want to look at the different contexts. Like there's a family context, like at home, there's the work, there's the community, there's a museum. So there's all these different sort of environments and contexts. And how do you, 
you know, bring empathy into those different ones. And, and also the, the sort of the mindsets, like if you're just like open and vulnerable, you know, what's going to happen there, but how do you really, you know, create the, that uh, empathic, environment and I guess it would be the social structures like if you're talking about dialogue for example yeah. is there space for people to get together you know do you facilitate that do you have chairs that are together how is it designed or even a classroom is a classroom designed with the you know the teacher just talking all the rows of chairs or is it more of a design you know with you know small groups uh, yeah. teams and so looking at all the sort of the social structures and exactly for, for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it will change in every setting. Mm -hmm. But of course, I mean, to, to achieve all this, uh, you really have to have the right ethics and values in place first, mm -hmm. uh, because th these uh, tools can also lead to manipulation. Mm -hmm. uh, you can just, you know, design experiences that serve only your cause or my cause, yeah. you know, or certain ideology. This is what we want to avoid, and I think that's why the, this creating this uh, narrative of you know, interconnectedness is has to go hand in hand with all this, you know, sort of design effort. And uh -huh. okay, so it's like the mindset. Whoever is doing the design, it's uh, you have to have. If you have a mindset of connectedness, how do you foster connection? Mm -hmm. and then you, your sort of your values is sort of what you create in a sense. So how do you create that value of, of valuing connection? Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and and also, I mean, um, uh, values such as you know, like uh, justice and you know, equality, um, uh, giving, uh, not giving, but you know, uh, having everyone have their voices heard. Yeah, and you know, sharing of power, uh, co-creation. You know, all those things we have to decide. Uh, but again, this requires intentionality. If I mean, and with knowing what we know, what all the information that knowledge uh, and the scientific you know, resources that are available to us, I think our humanity has never been this advanced in terms of knowledge. But then, you know, all this investment in our sort of intellect sort of reduced our ability to follow our hearts in a way, you know. Mm -hmm. So it is sort of an education of the heart, but in a scientific way. <laughs> Mm, right. Well, you know, one thing for me, I've really been, you know, I've been searching, you know, exploring this field for, for a while. And I've just come, started focusing on the empathy circle as sort of a sort of a structure to try to implement. My sense is that if everyone on the planet learned how to do an empathy circle, facilitate an empathy circle, that would be right there. That'd be like a first step that would, you know, really go a long ways. And that's where we have small groups of maybe four or five people, and we use mutual empathic listening. So, uh, you know, you're, you would speak, I reflect back my understanding of what you're saying until you feel really heard and understood. And then once you feel heard, uh, or if we have a time limit, five minutes, then mm -hmm. after that, I as become the speaker and I speak to someone and they reflect back what I'm saying and we go around for you know a couple hours but that has the sense of sort of fairness in terms of everybody gets heard fully uh, so it's putting bringing in a lot of those dynamics you're talking about you know the dynamics of sort of fairness yeah you know, that yeah. everybody has a chance to be heard yeah. and you kind of start developing sort of that mindset and it just seems to me like a like a first step that you know, you can, from that foundation, you can build a design team or do human centered design. You know, that's like exactly. a basic skill. So I've sort of been seeing it from this, you know, using, you know, Carl Rogers empathic listening uh, uh -huh. practice, but making it mutual, having mutual empathic yes. listening. So as a, so as also, as this, I just see it as a sample, an example of what you're talking about. Like, how do you create those dialogues so that there's fairness, how there's openness and, you know, vulnerability and, and those different qualities that the structure somehow kind of holds a lot of those values in, in the structure. Exactly. By design, right? It's By design, be. yeah. And agreement that you have to sort of agree. We agree. This is what we yeah. want, to, how we're going to conduct the, the conversation versus talk over each other yeah. or, 
or it be a competition. That's right. That's right. It is extremely important. I, I agree. I mean, this is a beautiful way of starting, you know, igniting this, you know, uh, this uh, energy. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know how are you with time. I can go as long as you want, but I don't <laughs> want to go over your, your time. Uh, limit. I, I'm okay. I okay. Mean, oh, good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Then, well, where do you see yourself going then with, uh, you, you've got these two books. I mean, you're am amazingly productive in terms of, you know, just all that you've been doing. Where, where do you see your, your work, uh, you know, the direction yeah. that you want to go? Yeah. Um, you know, I think a couple of things from just what you said, you know, inspired me is, you know, oh. one of the things is that um, I think... Um, I don't think, I, I strongly believe, actually, empathy is a human right. Mm -hmm. It is not something, yes, you know, some people are born with it, some people know that they have it, some people don't have it, you know, or don't know what to do with it. But the thing is that it is such an empowering uh, tool that can lead us to find our purpose and meaning in life by putting ourselves, our, us as an individual in a greater picture and and and. Once we do that, our, uh, it sort of uh, calibrates our engagement with the others. Mm -hmm. It harmonizes our engagement with the others and the environment. And, and it also leads to you know, creative thinking, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, innovation, better design of products, better businesses, you know, uh, environmental protection and all those things. But the thing is that this is uh, empathy only can be nurtured in a safe space. It cannot hold root in places where you're in a survival mode, day to day basis. Mm -hmm. If if you know, I'm just worried about you know what to eat, what to put on the table, uh, which is most of the population of the world is. It is extremely hard to you know get them to the, like spend their energy and focus on something like this. But on the other hand, this can be equally beneficial to everyone, to, to people even with very limited uh, means, uh, to see our, their, you know, find what is unique about themselves, uh, discover what, is, what makes them so unique in the greater picture and find and, and, and uh, appreciate mm -hmm, mm -hmm, themselves mm -hmm. as who they are. Yeah, uh, this could be the the, the utmost you know, survival tool that one might mm -hmm. need. So what I'm hearing there is that a large part of the world is maybe is in fear and stress, mm -hmm. and those qualities sort of inhibit empathy. And you're saying sort of empathy is almost like a human right. If everyone had the empathy that they needed, whatever the situation that they're in, it would it would foster their sort of internal well-being. Uh, their internal growth, their sense of learning about themselves. Exactly. And resiliency, you know, uh -huh. I mean, that, that makes us more resilient, you know, it gives us hope. Uh, but again, uh, when put in the right perspective, uh, beyond just our in-group empathy or like sort of expanding and talking about the, this interconnectedness, you know, framework. Uh, yeah. Well, I would say even in terms of, uh, of you know, a can a, a in a, a stressful environment is that, you know, you, well, I, I mean, I've done mediation, conflict mediation, for example, right? It's even in the family where people are just like really angry with each other and it's a highly stressed environment. But if someone has, is grounded in empathy and has some, you know, skills with it, they can listen to the parties and bring them together and sort of transform that stress. And, that's and, right. Uh, yeah. Right. So. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, so this is a. Um, I think um, we all each have a responsibility to really learn what, uh, what makes us uh, uh, want to serve, you know, to to the greater good. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how we find meaning and purpose and lead, you know, happy, fulfilled lives, and and empathy is at the core of it. And, um, and one of the actually, uh, besides the two books, you know, in between the two books, as I was working on designing for empathy, this unique opportunity uh, came up uh, to put together a, a truly interdisciplinary and cross-industrial uh, 
a group of around 30 people uh, to visit uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama in India. So, uh, and we call this summit you know, fostering uh, ethics and compassion through museums uh, because I think ultimately that's where we want to go with all this work. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, uh, but as I was preparing the book, again, one of the ingredients of the alchemy of empathy is collective journeying. Uh, sort of like a pilgrimage or, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like in Europe, actually, uh, like going to watching soccer could be like equivalent to that. You know, it's like this amazing group experience that you have, you know, synchronicity, you have your shared goal and shared experience. And and, um, so I thought, oh my gosh, this is like amazing, amazing opportunity. And it's a great experiment to see whether any of these, you know, alchemy, of empathy ingredients actually makes sense. Uh, uh-huh. uh-huh. So, so, so you're I, sort of testing, you're doing this trip, you're putting, bringing together these 30 some odd people and you're doing a trip together and you're going to see how exactly. you can bring empathy skill, you know, mindset yeah. or way of being into that group. Yeah. Sort of a shared and, journey. Of course, of course. And of course, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the key adhesive that brought all these people together is, the, the opportunity to meet with His Holiness in person. So, uh, and that is another ingredient, right? Because, so what makes him so special? Is it, again, one of the ingredients is authenticity. He's authentic. He lives what he says. You know, there's no gimmicks, basically. So, and, and we, we sense this without even talking. To, as we walk in the room, you sense it. And, 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 um, and it is very powerful and it is almost as powerful, I mean, similar to what you might uh, experience in, in front of a beautiful artwork, artwork uh, or, or as, as, as an example of some, like, some uh, creature from like you know, 10,000 years ago, you know, that some fossil or something that's mm-hmm. sort of authentic, that, that they, those um, objects and experiences have their own power over us. Mm-hmm. Uh, that open us up in, in, in different ways, you know? And, uh, and so, um, so I have designed this, the, the content and the experience of uh, the summit. And, and we were hosted by our you know, lovely colleagues at the Tibet Museum. Uh, the, as you know, they're an exile people. So they live in uh, uh, Dharamsala, India. Uh, they have an exile parliament and a museum and everything that a government needs. They're trying to protect and preserve their culture. It's a small museum of very highly dedicated six professionals. They not only hosted us the best way ever possible with most graciousness, but they also fully participated in all the workshops. I mean, it was amazing. I mean, just participating, going through the workshops took a lot of energy. On the, on the side, they were also hosting us, like helping us going one place to another. So. But it, it created this, again, this authentic experience and, and bond, which I think you know, none of us will ever forget. Mm-hmm. And we are forever grateful. I, for one, for, forever grateful for that. And um, so this whole experience had the ingredients of intentionality, intersectionality in the way that these 30 people were selected uh, by my initiative, Empathy Building Through Museums Initiative, uh, representing a diverse you know, group of museums, uh, uh, also uh-huh. different uh, museum professionals from different you know, museums, uh, from uh, uh, like a curator to exhibition designer or director and CEO in you know, different levels, uh, and also uh, representatives from you know, uh, arts, uh, IT, uh, performing mm-hmm. arts, uh, you know, theater, ballet, oh. uh, and um, uh, probably missing a lot, but, you know, experienced designers, social entrepreneurs, you know, amazing group of people. And, and um, in a very short time of period, like we had to sort of put this together and we had an appointment with His Holiness. Uh, but this, all these elements actually played out in real, real time for me. Uh, I saw how it was truly beneficial to the entire outcome of this experience to have these people in space together. And also it was an experiment because uh, just like you said, like by design, like how do you put the chairs around in a room can inform the, 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 the forthcoming experience. So this took 
all of us are out of our elements, right? We had to travel all the way across the world to, on top of this mountain. Most of us have never been. And, and we are jet lagged, you know, there's this you know, altitude problem, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from the CEO to, you know, the, like somebody like me who doesn't even work at a museum. We were all on equal terms. And, and, and especially in His, in his Holiness's presence, of course, you know, with authentic wisdom, you're forever humbled and you know that that adds another layer and uh and when we went into some workshops which took place in um uh, in temples uh, we had to take our shoes off so we were basically barefoot talking about the very things that we are talking right now uh in a, in a professional setting mm -hmm. but informally and it was it was quite interesting i don't know if you know anything like that will ever happen again but um I hope to uh, keep that community alive and, and repeat uh, a summit, uh, most likely not you know, as uh, sort of uh, uh, ambitious as you know, going to India or meeting His Holiness again, but uh, maybe here in the US and hopefully you'll be a part of the group and, and uh, see you know, uh, and learn from each other. Because at the end of the, the summit, which was uh, the, the, the entire thing like took like 10 days, but the workshops were uh, three and a half days long, full day uh, events uh, that included experiential learning, you know, design thinking, uh, sightseeing and, and, uh, and uh, information exchange. Uh, what came out at the end was we were thinking last half day we allocated to, um, uh, to strategy. And so what is next, right? And we were almost thinking, oh, okay, so, you know, like, do we create an institution? Do we create a, a nonprofit? You know, what does the org chart look like? You know, we were really, like, thinking um, um, very sort of nitty-gritty, you know, like, uh, hands-on. And then uh, one participant actually came up with the excellent idea, uh, the director of George Washington University and Textile uh, Museum, uh, John Wettenhall, he said, Look, you know, if, if I've learned anything out of this experience is that I think the best way for us to go is to mimic what His Holiness is doing. So he doesn't have, you know, like, you don't have to have an institution for something to work. You don't have to have, you know, hierarchy or, you know, org chart or anything. Uh, but you have to have commitments. And that's what uh, Dalai Lama has. He has, uh, I think, four or five lifelong commitments. And one of the, these commitments is compassion education. And that's why we were invited uh, and we were allowed to see him and have a you know, face to face meeting under that, his you know, lifelong commitment. See, because they, they work with educational institutions and academic institutions, but museums was something that they have not looked into. And that's where we met. Like there was all this work was taking place and there was this initiative. Uh, so this, this is how the, the uh, two worlds sort of merged. So we decided we are not Dalai Lama, so he has, let's say, five commitments, but maybe we can have two as a group. And one of them is pass it on. Whatever you learn, whatever you do, either through your actions or just by talking, sharing, publishing, dancing, whatever your form of communication is, uh, or creating a better dinner experiences for your family, pass it on. Whatever you have learned here, pass it on. That's a responsibility and a commitment we each made. And then the second commitment was uh, uh, allocate uh, three days of learning every year, as a group, uh, preferably. But if not, you can do it on your own, and you can choose and decide what that might look like for you, for your own cause, in your own context. And I found this approach quite liberating because as an individual, just like that water drop uh, metaphor, like we have all the ingredients in ourselves. And as, as when we come together, we are the ocean, but individually we are still the ocean <laughs> in, in a different format, but we still have the same attributes. So it, it depends on us uh, to choose uh, what to do with it and whether to use it uh, or not. So moving forward, I think, you know, I've been, um, uh, presenting in different conferences, trying to get into conversations uh, beyond museums, uh, mostly in the IT sector, uh, and designing of artificial intelligence and how to incorporate empathy 
ethics and compassion into these uh, experiences and technologies. Um, and um, uh, and this you know, empathy as a cross-industrial shared value is, I think, where I would like to take this next. Mm -hmm. uh, creating a, a platform uh, with some existing partners that I work with. I'm an advisor to some you know, ongoing projects. Uh, and expanding those sort of circles into a truly cross-disciplinary dialogue mm -hmm. and, and see what we can do with it, mm -hmm. how much we know about each other, how do we, whether we talk about the same thing or not. But without bringing them uh, around the table, this is very hard. And it, it only takes a meeting, basically, face-to-face -face meeting and understanding and, and dialogue. And, you know, things have their ways of you know, finding their way. Mm -hmm. uh, through you know fruition uh, it might take a month a year 10 years uh, but one of the things that Dalai Lama said that these are basically what are each our individual actions are seeds and 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 he was not looking for like five year 10 year uh, spectrum he, th he talked about 100 years and beyond what we are doing now are hopefully like grandchildren and their ch children will see hopefully the benefits of it but this is the time for us to act now because this is our responsibility we are here now and we are facing a choice mm -hmm. okay are you, are you saying then that you're so moving forward just like you did with that trip you brought an interdisciplinary group together they had like some shared pr project that they were doing shared intention and that you wanting to do more of that now is like, right? And you don't have, you, it's sort of like a, more of an emergence, like seeing what will emerge yeah. uh, from bringing this together and sort of having that intention of, yes. of uh, you know, seeing what will emerge and being able to share what, what your, your learnings are. And so it's sort of like keeping some of an open space, an openness exactly. in of moving forward. Yeah, openness uh -huh. and this sort of like, um, uh, give room for organic development, mm -hmm. what oh, comes up, yeah. you know, what forms. And, but by intentionality, by design, uh, it is important to notice these developments as they are happening, mm -hmm. right? And then sort of capture that moment and see what can be done with that. And then it doesn't mean that, you know, like I'm the right person to do all of this. That's, uh -huh. that's not it. But if my role is helping as a convener, and as perhaps inspiration or like putting this like vision or worldview or whatever, whatever people might take, you know, mm -hmm. here it is. I, I'm basically passing it on and, and sharing as much as I can. Well, it sounds like you, you have, you, I heard convener, right? The convener brings people together and kind of creates the environment for it. And you're kind of like open, like, where does this, where does this go? You're sort of like open. Yeah. To, to the direction you've sort of got the intention but you're open to what what emerges and what exactly uh, on, on, a, on a personal level because i'm in the middle of all this you know exciting you know development and you know new content coming you know emerging from all these you know different great minds uh because of my background in uh, islamic art history i also have a special interest in using uh islamic arts to foster empathy so when I go to you know workshops or when I give a lecture or presentation uh, to you know museums or other you know groups, I always find a uh, try to find a way for me to learn also. So it is not about just sharing what you have done already, but this is my life course. So I'm I'm in it to learn myself. Mm -hmm. I don't have all the answers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nobody yeah. does. So a value of the growth and learning exactly. for yourself. So exactly. you're a convener, but you're also learning and growing right. in exactly. sort of exactly. that process. Hopefully, so. that's the idea. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. And so it sounds like that's sort of, you just sort of have that as the future, kind of going in that general direction. Like more books, or you're just going to see what uh, comes up around that? Or yeah, see sure. what comes up, mm -hmm. what, what content comes. If, if, if a book is most useful to get that question, uh, across or put it on the table uh, it might be a book it might be another summit you know with a similar kind of experience with different people adding on to the you know group that we have um, 
Yeah, I mean, I have ideas. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm never short of ideas, so yeah. we'll see. <laughs> yeah, ideas, yeah. Very, a lot of ideas bubbling there. I see that. Also very productive working. Well, one thing I've been really trying to focus on is on these empathy circle dialogues. Yes. So bringing people together. You know, I've been bringing recently, I've done like four or five of them now with different authors, you know, have written like those two shelves of books are all oh. books on empathy. And I've interviewed like most of the authors. So I'm now starting to bring the authors together to do empathy circles, you know, for people. And we use mutual empathic listening okay. as sort of the dialogue process. So if you're interested, I'd love to have you take part in one of the, you know, more, as many as you want, empathy circles. Thank you. Thank and, you. And Thank we record them to. and post them. And yeah, I would love to please, you know, keep me posted. It's just, uh, I have been very busy recently with, you know, all these developments and, uh, you know, the, the, the summit and then the book and, and, um, um, yeah, I would love to be uh, involved, and if there's any way I can contribute, you know, you think might be useful, I'm more than happy to. Mm, great, yeah. Well, I found, you know, the, uh, the the work I do is sort of based, I mean, I've really grounded in the work of Carl Rogers and, you know, the empathic active listening, and it's just, I mean, it's just basically the, the core of the whole therapeutic counseling, you know, way of being is like a core practice as well as for mediation if you just see the you know if you've done mediation type work but it's also kind of a foundation for that and i'm just seeing like how do we really spread as a first step uh, i you know i'm just trying to see now how to really spread that as a practice because it seems to be a gateway into a lot of different uh practices yeah. like it's yeah. like this one little skill uh, but if everybody learned it and was able to facilitate, uh, yeah. you know, it's, so that's kind of where I've been yeah. focusing on. And I, I, I think I think it is uh, um, so. One of the important sort of aspects of that uh, goal is, I think, to uh, get you know people who are not normally a part of this conversation uh, to to see the value in this of this yeah. type of conversation. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, get them involved, which is what you are doing, uh, but also in terms of other industries. Um, because when we mention, we talk about empathy, it is con usually considered this, you know, soft, you know, nebulous thing that nobody can, you know, put a finger on it. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, but it is not that. I mean, we have a lot of resources, science, science evidence-based resources now. Uh, and and uh, knowing that, articulating that, and you know, expanding our circles to other industries so that they can find uh, practical uses of this knowledge uh, in their fields. And then hopefully they'll re realize that this is something to invest in and then expand their circles within their context. Yeah, it's like really how to create, create that seed in all the different industries so that they can, yeah. sort of those industries can yeah. Build, yeah. build on it. Yeah. 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 Well, that well, and I think it's you know empathy is wherever wherever people come together. You know, yeah. wherever there is a relationship, uh, is you know it's it's immensely helpful. There. That's true. So well, okay, well, great. Um, yeah, I would love to have you know if you have more. Yeah, you know, just love to hear talking and you know about the empathy and you know open to doing more uh, dialogues. If there's any specific topic as well as. Uh, having these empathy circles, you know, going forward. So I'd love to keep in contact around that. And yes, I'm, let's do that. Yeah, I'm heading over to the Democratic uh, State Convention in All right. San Francisco right after this. Okay. And I'll be having my empathy T-shirt. And so we're, right. we're uh, you know, I'm trying to get the politicians. I'm I'm kind of been trying to work with in the political field, bring the politicians yeah. together to dialogue yeah. in the political left and right. Uh -huh. you know, and uh -huh. so that's going to be trying to promote, promote, promote it over there. See if we can get Nancy Pelosi will be there. So maybe we'll. Oh, she her. will be. Okay. Well, so maybe we'll get her to do an empathy circle. So. Yeah, why not? Why not? I know that she's a friend of uh, Dalai Lama. So. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Maybe <laughs> yeah. the two of them would take she's part. She's definitely maybe interested, in, yeah, interested yeah. in, you know, compassion and, and, and values and empathy. 
Oh, I forgot. Usually at the beginning, I mentioned how people can get in contact with you, but it'll be down below. There'll be links. So your website is? Yes, I think my website would be good. Uh, and I think there's a way for people to leave messages or send me messages. And um, uh, I think that would be the best way to announce it to the greater world here. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, it'll be down in the chat window yeah. in the yeah. description of this yeah. document. So. Well, okay. Well, thanks for, for, you know, chatting with me. You've just been really admiring all the work you've been doing and, Thank you, so much. Uh, you know, look forward to staying connected and, you know, really working together to build a more empathic society and culture. Thank you, Edwin. I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much for including me. Uh, well, I appreciate sure. it.